I'd like to take you on a journey, a journey to a world of the very, very small. And in doing so, I can describe to you the convergence that's going on between nature, nurture, and nanomedicine. The <coughs> possibilities are endless here. Now think about where we've been. 100 years ago, diseases ran rampant in the population. So much progress has been made. But we still have problems, significant hurdles to overcome. Even after sequencing the human genome, it's a tough time to try to live for a long life without succumbing to, to problems of disease. The major killers are still out there, the six biggest killers of all time that we don't understand. We don't know where they come from, and we don't know how to treat them. Let's take a look at them quickly. These common grievous diseases and syndromes many of us here suffer from, and most of us know people who have. Autoimmune diseases, 5% of us have these types of afflictions. Diabetes, 10%, and that's predicted to escalate to 20% in the world in the next 10 years. Complications of infection continue to take their toll on 15% of us. And neurodegeneration, diseases such as Alzheimer's, they affect 1% of us, but that's going to increase as the population ages. Think about cardiovascular disease. We all, to some degree, virtually suffer from this. And cancer. Cancer is probably one of the biggest killers of all time. And the reason that only 0.5% of the living population has cancer is because once it's diagnosed, it's so lethal. So few people survive with cancer. Now imagine, imagine a world without these diseases and syndromes. So why aren't we there yet? What pieces in the puzzle of disease are we missing? The answers to that actually reflect an age-old question, and that is the relative contribution of nature and nurture to the human condition. This has been a topic of discussion and debate for centuries. Nature means that which is innate, innate, which is part of us, our gen genes, our genetic inheritance. In contrast, nurture is that which is acquired after we are born, through experiences, through interactions with our environment. So what is the environment? What are these factors that may be so important to understand the balance and what causes disease? Certainly diet is one of them, the chemicals that we come into contact with, but there's something else that's recently been discovered. Other factors, other components in the environment we're just beginning to understand, and they're actually a part of us. They're not part of nature, but they're part of nurture. Consider, for example, cancer. Now, we may inherit genes that predispose us to cancer, but studies of twins indicate that cancer is generally an environmental and not a genetic disease. So I'm going to tell you today about two particular components that make up nurture that we're just beginning to understand, but which we need and tools to further discover wh what, these, what, these, what these common uh, problems are. One of them are microbes. Microbes are a part of us. And in fact, all the microbes that make up our body, we need them. We actually need them. We can't live without them. They're called the human microbiome. Who are they and, and what are they doing? You might feel a little uneasy to realize that each of us has five pounds of bacteria in us. They outnumber our own cells 10 to 1. There's probably a thousand or more species. We don't even know all the players yet. And the variation in them in each of us marks us almost like a fingerprint. The variation, in fact, occurs in each of us during disease, and now we know that changes in the microbiome can contribute to disease. In fact, in laboratory settings, transferring a microbiome from one animal to another can transfer the disease process and can actually alter the behavior of the animal. So clearly, the microbiome is a part of nurture. It's something that we're still struggling to understand with, all, with the tools that we have. But there's something else also that contributes to nurture, something that's actually a part of us. And I sometimes refer to that as the dark matter of cells because its structure and function are so hard to understand. What it is is a matrix of molecules that exists on the cell surface. And in between cells, it acts as a depot, a storage reservoir. And it also, we know now from early indications that it's playing a major role in the onset and progression of disease. It actually also provides the first handshake that goes on between our cells and between our cells and the environment, the microbes in the environment. So why is the dark matter so hard to understand? Why can't we study it better? 
The reason for that is because like the microbiome, it's not directly encoded by our genes. So let me tell you a little bit more about that. See, our cells actually include nature and nurture. All cells include four types of fundamental structural and molecular components. The cell is the basic unit of life, and we need to understand the composition of the cell and to be able to look at it carefully. Now, the cell is composed of nucleic acids. This makes up the DNA and RNA, our genes. And those genes then go ahead and encode what are called proteins. Proteins are the second component of cells. Also, there are two other unique and remarkable components that make up all cells, all forms of life, and that includes lipids. Lipids are like fats. They, we get them in part from our diet, and they're very important to compartmentalize the cell to decide what is inside and what is outside. But also something else, molecules called glycans. These are a combination of diverse complex sugar molecules that are linked together in various arrays and formats we're still just beginning to understand. The interesting thing about lipids and glycans is they're not directly encoded by our genes. They track more with metabolic processes, which then tracks with nurture. So how can we explain these mysteries? How are we going to understand things like glycans and the microbiome? Because they're so important. In fact, glycans are a major component of the dark matter of cells. We need tools. We need the right tools to be able to understand these components, to be able to integrate them all so we can discover the origins of disease, because without discovering the origins, we can't come up with the, with the right cures. So in biology, we need really small tools to understand disease. And it's the advent of nanotechnology which has enabled the engineering of such tools to uh, tell us about the composition of the microbiome and the dark matter of cells. To, gen to be able to interrogate the, these components and to understand them better. Now, nanotechnology is the ability to engineer matter at the atomic scale. A f a, an amazing, amazing, a, an amazing potential. And that allows us to generate unique therapeutics and biodevices, such as these which can analyze microbiome growth in and, and, and small chips the size of a microscope slide. There's another uh, product that can be made through nanotechnology, and that includes something really fundamentally important to nanomedicine, and those are nanoparticles. Now, nanoparticles are too small to see, so I've illustrated one here. A, a wonderful graphic artist, Peter Allen, contributed to this illustration. Now, nanoparticles are small biomachines with multiple abilities. They have components on their surface which detect and bind to disease, the changes on the cell surface that indicate this is a diseased cell or this is a healthy cell. And once that binding occurs, they can fuse with cells that, and in that way, release their payload or their cargo, which can be engineered to include therapeutics, drugs, and imaging agents. Now, we have the ability to model these processes, that is, nanoparticle-based therapeutics that represent nanomedicine in the future, I believe, of healthcare and treatment. We can do that with a very, very special instrument and facility that exists nowhere else except in Santa Barbara, and that's the Allosphere on the UC Santa Barbara campus. The Allosphere is a three-story high cylinder. It's a multimedia digital computer. Scientists can take their biological and physical data and render it into four dimensions. Researchers in the allosphere are suspended on a bridge in the center, immersed fully within their data. Now, we've begun a collaboration with some of the top computational scientists at the allosphere, led by Dr. Joanne Cochera Morin. And what we want to do is show you today our, our, our premiere. It's an early rendition of how nanomedicine will contribute to solving the problem of, of cancer. So I'll cue the movie at this point and, and direct your attention, if I could, to the, to the screen and our subject. This is a volunteer, a healthy individual actually, who's had an MRI done from head to toe. Every possible 
area of the body has been imaged and then digitized and then reconstructed in three dimensions. You're only going to see two dimensions here. We can fade in and out on this individual. We can look and see precisely the anatomy of the individual. This is not an illustration. This is a real body. This has been done nowhere else except here at the allosphere. Now we're going to show you organs fade out. We're going to focus on the thoracic region. You just saw the stomach disappear. All of the different systems are color coded for us. There goes the intestinal tract. And we're doing this to give you a better view of where we're going to go next. We have other components in here. The neural system is, is color coded in, in, in yellow. The lymphatic system is color coded in green. And you're seeing also we're retaining the organs that we're going to further study, which includes the liver and the pancreas. The arteries are color coded red, and the veins are color coded blue. Now, cancer often starts in some of these tissues. In fact, pancreatic cancer, we're going to model for you, is being started in the pancreas and then may metastasize to the liver. And I'll show you that the route that we're going to take through this individual. We're going to tra travel through the artery into the pancreatic region, and then we're going to come out into the liver and ultimately out into the vein. But before we can travel inside a human being like this, we need to shrink you down. We need to shrink you down to the size of a cell or a nanoparticle. So let's go, go with that now. From the meter level down to the millimeter level, down into the micrometer level. Once we get into the micrometer level, we can begin to see individual cells. Below that, we begin to see the bacteria that are even smaller than cells. But we have to go much, much smaller than that to see nanoparticles and viruses. So once we're this small, we can then move inside the the individual and we can start to look about and make sure whether the individual is healthy or whether there may be something wrong. So we've cleared away a lot of the blood that makes up the vasculature so you can see, although it's extremely dark, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can see that. Once we get into the veins, I think you'll see more. But as we travel through, our, ourselves as nanoparticle observers are picking out changes. We can detect changes that occur. I think you'll see it better here. And down the road of this vascular bed, you're going to see what appears to be a cancer, a cancer that has invaded into the vasculature. Now that cancer has changes on it, changes on its cell surface that we can detect. And one of the difficult things about cancer is it metastasizes. So it may start in the pancreas, but it may travel somewhere else. And that's typically what kills in cancer. So we have to be able to access cancer no matter where it is. Now, to be able to treat cancer requires the addition of nanoparticles to the patient. And this is the future. This is a rendition that I, we didn't have time to generate the, the, fluidic, uh, the fluidic basis of, but we're going to travel through and I'm going to show you what a nanoparticle is, is capable of doing. These particles are emitting light, so they tell us back uh, in the surgical table and research exactly where they're going. They're not binding to anything because they only will bind to diseased tissue. So as they, we travel through the vasculature, you can see these nanoparticles in the vasculature. They're not, again, because it's not radiation, it's not chemotherapy, there won't be any collateral damage. We can target these particles precisely to where they're supposed to go in the body. So as they travel through the, the vasculature, they'll find the cancer. And once they find the cancer, they'll attach to it, like I described about the, what the nanoparticles are capable of doing. So they travel through the vasculature. Now we're outside the vasculature just watching an animation of nanoparticles. As they come in contact with the tumors, they light up the tumors. Scientists have now figured out how to not only attach the nanoparticles, but to get the drugs to travel completely through the tumor, which is really important. And once these nanoparticles attach to the tumor, they release their payload. Their payload, again, which includes therapeutics. It includes toxins that will kill the cancer, but they won't touch the other tissue. So that collateral damage I've talked about that goes on right now in cancer treatment, we can eliminate that. That's the future of nanomedicine. That's what we can achieve. Now, what you've just seen is a, is a rendition of nanomedicine in the treatment of cancer. And nanomedicine, the goals of which are threefold, and what you've seen an example of that, and that is to discover disease biomarkers, to be able to find the disease early and identify it precisely. Very important. And to develop tissue and cell targeting systems that allow us to get the treatment to the right place and to abolish side effects. And then to incorporate into this therapy combinatorial therapeutics, because we want to make the treatment effective, of course, and optimally a cure. So what is nanomedicine? 
Well, nanomedicine is an offshoot of nanotechnology, and it can be defined as a comprehensive monitoring, maintenance, and repair of all biological systems spanning nature and nurture, working from the molecular level using engineered devices and nanostructures for medical benefit. And that's the key. Nanomedicine transcends nature and nurture. We're no longer limited to genetic or biochemical processes. We can make anything we can imagine, and we can target that to where it needs to go. So imagine, imagine a university with the best minds in material sciences, physics, engineering, com computational sciences, collaborating with the nation's top-ranked biomedical research institute. That's precisely what we're doing here in Santa Barbara today by founding the Center for Nanomedicine, a joint venture between UC Santa Barbara and the Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute. So what I've shown you today is not science fiction. Already the devices and instruments of nanomedicine are making their way from the bench into the clinic. And I think with continued support for nanomedicine research, the next 10 years are going to be extraordinary. Come visit us at the Center for Nanomedicine or visit us online. Some of you will remember our website because it's engraved on a number of iPod nanos that, like nanoparticles, are very small and easily hidden. So take a look carefully underneath the back of your seats when you stand up at the next break. <laughs> Thank you.